We made plans to see many of them again on our new courts in Salinas. As we drove south from Aptos on the coastal highway towards Salinas, John and I chatted aimlessly about what our new house might be like and our future neighbours and friends. We talked about old friends and the conversation drifted to our recent vacation in Hawaii. What a tropical paradise. We would be there again for the James MacArthur Celebrity Tournament in the summer, and we were already looking forward to it. But that was almost five months away, we groaned. Wouldn't it be terrific if we could go sooner? Think of all the fun we could have until the tournament. The restaurants and the breathtaking scenery and the tennis opportunities and the intriguing ethnic cultures and the... Suddenly we looked at each other. Why were we going to Salinas? We really wanted to go to Hawaii. We pulled over by the side of the highway and hesitatingly considered the prospect. We had no commitments in Salinas. Our house was sold and we had enough money to live on for a while without working. The kids were busy with their own lives and we really loved Hawaii. Should we? Do it. A long pause. We both broke into smiles and that said it all. We turned the car around and drove up to San Francisco. Several days later we left for Honolulu and we remained in Hawaii for ten years. What began that day in the spring of 1974 as an exciting adventure eventually took us to the collapse of our marriage, the brink of divorce, and, ultimately, to the writing of these memoirs. Hawaii is just like the travel brochures describe it, only better. No folder can describe the welcome feeling of coming upon a string of islands rissing out of the Pacific Ocean more than 2,500 miles from the west coast. After long hours of staring at the flat, blue ocean below, they suddenly appear out of nowhere. The distant spots become eight distinct mountainous islands, large, green and lush. The capital, Honolulu, is located on Oahu, one of the smaller islands near the upper end of the chain. From Oahu, it is 55 miles to the next link in the chain, Molokai, 84 miles to Maui, and 169 miles to the big island, Hawaii. Scattered among them are the smaller islands, Lanai, the Pineapple Isle, Kauai, the Garden Isle, and the Rocky Crag at the northwestern tip of the chain, justly named Nihau, the Forbidden Isle. Together they make up a tropical paradise, as startling and beautiful as it must have first appeared to the great explorer of the Pacific, Captain James Cook, who discovered them in 1778 and named them the Sandwich Islands. The discovery of the native kingdom attracted an army of intrepid missionaries, sailors and immigrants, many of whom paid a high price for life in paradise. Captain Cook was killed by the Hawaiian natives the year after his arrival. At the time when Napoleon was Emperor of Europe, Hawaii was ruled by the powerful King Kamehameha I, who united the islands. When America was on the verge of the automobile age, Queen Lydia Liliwokalani lived in a grass hut. Hawaii became of strategic importance in the 1890s and was annexed by the United States in 1898. Basking in sunshine almost year-round, the Hawaiian islands contain breathtaking mountain roads and tropical rainforests, beaches with unending assortments of beautiful bodies, and high cliffs where one can watch humpback whales frolicking a short distance out to sea. A paradise. People in Amis, Yewa, wait their whole lives to come to Hawaii for a two-week vacation, and TV contestants hold their briefs in the hope that the Tuti MC will announce that they have won the trip. Hawaii is everyone's dream vacation, and Jean and I were going to go there. We arrived with plenty of money and no particular schedule. My only obligation was the James MacArthur Celebrity Tournament during the summer. We began like any tourists, starting with Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, Diamond Head and Waikiki Beach. From there we went to the island of Kauai and roamed the Waimea Canyon and tried to count the reported 40 shades of green that grow on the slopes of the Waialil Mountains. We travelled to Maui and strolled the streets of Lahaina Town for a look at what whaling life in the 1800s was like. We gawked at the posh resorts at Kanapali and Kapalua, drove along the spectacular coast roads and past the sugarcane plantations, and trekked up a 10,000-foot dormant volcano. Next came the big island of Hawaii, where we marvelled at the black sand beaches and the snow-capped mountains. 
the fields of orchids and anthuriums, and the original culture of Polynesia. It was all so beautiful I could scarcely believe we were going to actually live here. By the beginning of summer we figured that it was time to settle down. We chose a new development at Makaha, about 30 miles north of Honolulu, on the remote side of the island of Oahu. It was a native Hawaiian community, and we were among the few Caucasians living there. We bought a lovely 12th floor condominium on the edge of one of the world's greatest beaches at Turtle Bay. I often sat on the balcony and stared out at the fabulous sunsets beyond Makaha's Lahi Lahi Point and considered the events that had brought me here. Had I really spent my childhood in that remote Silesian town? Was I related to the soldier in the Africa Corps, hungry and exhausted after months of battle, who sometimes passed through my dreams? It was even becoming hard to recall that I once laboured in the migrant worker camps of the San Joaquin Valley. Where might I be today, I wondered, if things had been different? One thing was certain. If I hadn't escaped from that prisoner of war compound at Deming, New Mexico, I would be living under the Russians. My old town of Schweidnitz was now part of northern Poland. Poland. Of all the places in the world where I could imagine spending my life, communist Poland was definitely the least attractive. I thought sadly about my parents and my older brother and sister, Paul and Lotta. Their lives had been filled with war and deprivation. They had lived under the Kaiser, the Nazis, and finally the Soviets. They represented an entire tragic generation of modern Europe, whose world had been shattered by World War I, crippled by the catastrophic inflation of the 1920s, followed by the Great Depression, Hitler and World War II. Even after the war, Europe offered little promise of security, as the survivors faced new tribulations of devastation and foreign occupation. My family was representative of millions of Europeans whose lives were scarred by war, upheaval and fear. Yet, they had saved me, cast me to safety. They had prepared me for survival, very much like the opening scene of the Superman story, when the parents put their infant into a rocket as their planet erupts around them. They encouraged the very skills that I needed to start life anew. My father even paid to have me take some driving lessons, although at the time I was mystified because we didn't own a car. They were pleased that I decided to study English. It was as though my family had spared me the fate of their generation. I always felt that they would have been proud of my successful survival in America, and that they would have understood my need to cut all emotional ties the day I decided to escape from Camp Deming. I knew that they wouldn't have wanted me to risk my safety in America by tracking their whereabouts after the war. Perhaps their mail was being watched, and a letter from me might have led to my arrest. I cannot help but think that they would have been disappointed at such carelessness. They had thrown me to safety, and I would have compromised everything over an unnecessary postcard. Who knows what would have happened to me if I had stayed in the prisoners of war camp and allowed myself to be repatriated to Schwednitz. One thing was sure. I wouldn't be sitting out here on the balcony of my high-rise condominium watching the last rays of a magnificent sunset in Hawaii. John and I had no trouble adjusting to our new lives in Hawaii. Although we didn't need the money yet, John decided to look for some work. She had no difficulty landing an interesting job in the Hawaiian Department of Social Services. This time, instead of caring for the migrant workers of California, she was responsible for providing social services to the shrinking population of native Hawaiians, most of whom lived in our community of Makaha and in Nanakuli. Working among the locals, she developed a special relationship with Hawaii that tourists never experience. I, on the other hand, was not ready for a nine-to-five job, and since we had the money, I decided to pursue tennis and painting instead. I developed a daily routine of playing tennis with local champions like old Mr. Tamura, known as Mr. Tennis of nearby Waianae, his son Cliff and Vernon Daly, a former U.S. Army tennis champion, and one of the first pros at Honolulu's famous Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Then came a swim at Makaha Beach, and finally, I spent the late afternoon learning to paint in oils, aided by lessons from my friend Ed Fawcett, who had since opened an art gallery on Front Street in Lahaina on Maui. I sat out on the balcony, 
called Alani in the islands, sketching and enjoying the sunsets. Weekends, John and I spent together, driving through the tropical rainforests or eating poi at a native luau. We quickly grew to love the Hawaiians and their relaxed lifestyle. I felt especially comfortable since everyone had an accent and most didn't care for the Federates any more than I did. Before I knew it, the James MacArthur Celebrity Tournament had arrived. As the co-star of TV's popular show Hawaii Five O and a fine tennis player in his own right, Dano's name added lustre to those of dozens of other major celebrities who graciously lent their time and enthusiasm for charity. MacDonald Carey, Claudine Langer, Mike Connors, Paul Lucas and many more. Lloyd Bridges and I played as doubles partners. Ten years later, I bumped into him at the Aspen Pro-Am tournament and we reminisced about our match in Hawaii. What fun to have someone like Lloyd Bridges recognise you among hundreds of star-struck ticket holders and reach out for a handshake. By the spring of 1975, our nest egg was nearing bottom and I felt it was time to consider a job. There were few opportunities as a tennis pro for one of the major hotels or racket clubs, so I found myself leaning toward my old work in the construction trade. There wasn't much glamour, but it paid more than tennis lessons and occasional tournament prizes. I was also getting leery of my high profile. I was taking too many chances. It was time to find a new challenge and a well-paying job. There was another reason that we needed money. The kids had each decided to join us in Hawaii. Mark was attracted by our description of life in Hawaii and felt that the opportunities in the hotel business were better than on the mainland. We were delighted to see him. He went to work at the exclusive Japanese-owned Makaha Inn as a bell activities person called a bellboy in the old days and within a year and a half was promoted to assistant manager an impressive position in a resort state that lives on tourism and pride of service. Then Lynn and her husband, Bob, and their infant son, Michael, our wonderful new grandchild, arrived from Boulder. We spent our remaining savings on a condominium for them at nearby Aya, and gloried in having our little brood around us once again. If we were hoping for permanence, we were wrong. Two years later, Lynn and Bob split up, and she took young Michael back to Colorado. She eventually married Steve Gross, whom I am pleased to report has turned out to be the goal she spent so many years pursuing. They have a solid and loving relationship and still live harmoniously in Colorado. Mark remained in Hawaii for a couple of more years before the lure of business advancement drew him to Colorado as well. When they both appeared in Hawaii in 1975, however, it was clear that I needed to find a good paying job. One day I noticed from the balcony that there was some construction starting right below us. I wandered down to take a look and found that some Chinese developers were going to build 600 living units for a new subdivision called Holiday Plantation. Since many in the community, mostly native Hawaiians, were unemployed, I figured that my experience as a millman estimator might get me in. I walked into the construction office and asked for an application. To my surprise, the project manager's name was familiar. He was Bob Brubeck, brother of the famous jazz musician Dave Brubeck, whom I knew of when he played at the Black Hawk Club in San Francisco. We reminisced about the old days over a cup of coffee and after listening to my work, history with Herb, the Clark Door Company, and the rest. He waved aside any need for a formal application and made me the project's small tool purchaser. I was very pleased, first because I was able to avoid the dreaded application form, and second, it was a position of some importance considering the hundreds of carpenters and construction workers who were employed on the development. They all required a wide array of tools, and it was my responsibility to anticipate their needs and buy the tools at the best price. Everything had to be stored, maintained and accounted for. It was a challenging job, all right, but the paperwork was killing. Besides, once the tools were bought, and I set up a system to identify them and keep pilferage under control, my task was basically over. I convinced Bob to assign me to other tasks. Over the next months, I held a variety of positions, eventually rising to safety inspector, a dangerous job considering the high winds, volcanic rock and pace of construction. 
In fact, to counteract a rash of unusual accidents, we arranged a ceremony so the gods could bless the construction site. When the holiday plantation development was finished, I had the business contacts to look for another project. My next job was bigger, as I had hoped, but also scarier. I hired on with a Milwaukee-based construction firm called Town Realty Company, which had a government contract to build 2,000 living units at the Navy base at Puloa. My responsibilities were extremely demanding, and I found out that my predecessor had quit in despair. I had to supply the exact amount of lumber and material for each unit, a mind-boggling task that involved the calculation of thousands of board feet cut to the last inch. If the carpenters were short one board foot of lumber, they couldn't finish the house on schedule. Two or three feet of lumber beyond their needs meant a reprimand from the project supervisor about wastefulness and tight budgets. I practically lived in a huge trailer parked on the construction site, surrounded by blueprints, adding machines, slide rule and material supply books. Part of my success at the job was due to a young boom operator named Rudy, who often alerted me to unseen problems, double-checked my calculations, and sometimes moved lumber around if I came up short at one unit or delivered too much to another. Interestingly, Rudy was a German immigrant who had studied some engineering at school and who attacked mathematics problems with a doggedness for which the Germans are famous. He was anxious to make a go of it in America, and we often found time for small talk. I never revealed my story to him, of course, and listened in silence when he told me about the devastation of the post-war years. He had no intention of giving up and returning to the limited opportunities in Germany, and neither did I. Although Rudy never knew how much we had in common, we made a good team and stayed together on the next several jobs. Our favourite expression during that time we said it laughingly was, let's blitz them with materials. The frightening part of the job was that we were working on a contract for the government. The construction site was on the outskirts of the naval base and was hopping with sentries. There were plenty of checkpoints, chain-link fences and identification cards. It was nerve-wracking from morning to night and probably accounted for the substantial amounts of time I spent locked in the trailer with my calculations. No sooner did we finish the units at Puloa than Town Realty announced a new contract. We were all moved to the army post at Schofield Barracks in the middle of Oahu to build 2,500 living units, and the terror began again. More military police, ID cards and chain-link fence since we were working outside the perimeter of the main post, I didn't worry about a direct confrontation, though the possibility of a serious run-in was ever-present. I just prayed that my luck would hold out. Things were not going well at home. Lynn had separated from Bob and left with Michael for Colorado. We had no sooner adjusted to being grandparents when the chance to practice that evaporated. Doug was making plans to leave Hawaii as well, though it was with confidence and enthusiasm in the future. Jean was totally immersed in the problems of the native Hawaiians and Samoans and had little time to listen to my problems. On the few occasions when I tried to explain my fears of working around the military bases, she would shake her head in bewilderment. In retrospect, I can't blame her. What normal adult was frightened of harmless sentries and chain-link fence? Why didn't I tell her the truth now? We'd been married almost fifteen years, and we knew each other as well as we were probably going to. I could no longer believe that she would leave me because of it, although to tell the truth our relationship was strained enough so that I doubt if I would have been distraught if she had. Then why couldn't I sit her down on a quiet Sunday afternoon and unravel the story of my past? I think it was now an issue of embarrassment. I didn't want to look foolish or criminal. I had worked too hard to create a heroic image to see it shattered. No, I decided, I would tough it out, sentries and all. I had boxed myself in and couldn't seem to find a way out. My anxiety continued to increase at work as the jobs brought me into closer contact with the military. We did a job, for example, near Coal Coal Pass, where the Japanese planes crossed over Oahu when they attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Marine guards were stationed at Coal Coal Pass, and I was checked daily as I went to and from the construction site. The guards were seldom the same, and each insisted on a thorough examination of my company ID. 
On more than one occasion, my anxiety erupted as anger at being checked again, and I often took the long way around to avoid trouble. Jeanne naturally couldn't understand why I was being so sensitive about a few questions. Ah, to be an American, and not to be frightened of the authorities. It was not only the military who concerned me. As our company took on larger and larger contracts, we often hired labourers who were ex-cons or who had police problems of their own. That meant that we were sometimes visited by parole officers and detectives who wanted to talk to one of our workers. I was becoming a nervous wreck, and going home to Jean didn't help. I thought that changing jobs might do the trick. By now I had a good reputation in the construction industry, and when we finished the project at Coal Coal Pass I decided to look for another job. Jean was perturbed that I would leave such a good job with Town Realty but shrugged it off and went back to her clients. I applied for work at Morrison Knudsen, one of the ten largest construction companies in the United States. They were embarking on an ambitious project to build some 3,000 military homes in a vast, shallow volcanic crater, and I was made responsible for all the lumber required. This was a monster project, and one that again brought me uncomfortably close to the military. It was much the same story. Long weeks burrowed in the trailer office furiously calculating from my native metric system to feet and yards, and trying to look casual when passing through the guard posts, or when I suddenly ran into a parole officer looking for one of my crew. On one occasion I ran afoul of the Marine Commandant. It began as a minor disagreement and escalated out of control. He felt that I was challenging his authority on the construction site. I know that I was simply tired and overworked. Whatever the reason, I went home and told Jeanne the story. I asked for her help. Now here was something she could get her teeth into. Outraged at the way the damn military had treated her husband, she called the Commandant and read him the riot act. California girls are like that. While I felt like a high school kid whose mother calls the principal on his behalf, I basked in safety at hearing her shout into the telephone about what steps she intended to take if he ever interfered with her husband's work again. By the time Jean slammed down the phone on a marine colonel who probably wished he was back fighting the Viet Cong, I was surer than ever that I just couldn't tell her the truth about my past. I needed her strength and support, her innocent outrage on my behalf, and her love. The fact that the Commandant gave me a wide berth from then on only convinced me that I couldn't do anything to break her faith in me. The construction project eventually ended on schedule, and we all waited for the final report from company headquarters in Boise, Idaho. It was our report card, so to speak, which evaluated our performance and adherence to our budgets. A bad report would seriously damage our reputations in the industry and make finding another job difficult. When the report came in, it turned out that I had calculated and supplied more than five million board feet of lumber to within inches of their requirements and I had done it within budget. I was a hero. Morrison Knudsen asked me to stay on. I was thrilled, but at the same time I knew that I owed much of my success to Jean's timely intervention. One job led to the next, and by 1979 I rose to become Morrison Knudsen's Director of Marketing in Hawaii. Meanwhile, problems were developing at home. Jean was working very hard and began talking about a vacation, I thought it was a terrific idea at first. I assumed that she was considering a trip to one of the islands, or perhaps to the mainland, to visit Lynn and Doug. One day she brought home a bunch of travel brochures for Fiji. For some reason, I had never thought that she wanted to travel out of the country. To go to Fiji required a passport, and a passport in turn required proof of citizenship. I had to have a birth certificate to get a passport. Since I had no such documents, of course, the vacation to Fiji was out of the question. But what could I tell John? First I said that it was too much money. She waved that argument aside and showed me how inexpensive the trip really was. Then I complained about not having enough time. Out came the calendar as she pointed out the large spaces in our schedules during the coming months. Next, I pleaded fatigue, which she saw as an additional reason for the vacation. This went on for weeks. I would come up with a reason for not going to Fiji, and Jean would show me how ridiculous I was being. 
Why are you fighting so hard? she kept asking. I'm not fighting, I would reply. I just don't feel like going to Fiji. But why not? Just because. And so it went. John knew that there had to be a reason for such nonsense, but for the life of her, she couldn't imagine what it was. How could she have known that it simply revolved around my inability to get a passport? Jean finally threw up her hands and went alone. She had a wonderful trip to Fiji, and aside from several evenings of looking at her photographs, the subject seldom came up again. But I knew that the seed had been planted. John was growing more and more troubled about me, and the Fiji fiasco only served to confirm her doubts. Something was very wrong in our lives. Just when things settled down, another problem appeared. Morrison Knudsen offered me a wonderful opportunity. They had just secured a lucrative contract in Saudi Arabia and asked if I would go as a member of the supervisory team. The salary was impressive for those days, $3,000 a month, but I knew I couldn't accept. I would have needed a passport. I made the mistake of mentioning the offer to Jean, who thought it was a terrific opportunity. I told her that I had decided against it. Why? she demanded. Too far from home. She couldn't understand it. But what a wonderful chance to see the world, she argued. And besides, we could use the money. I was firm. I simply didn't want to go. But why not? You always loved to travel. We started another round of arguments. I told her that it was too hot in Saudi Arabia. She shook her head. Then I said that I didn't get along with some of the other members of the supervisory team. Jean wasn't convinced. Finally, I said that I would be lonely away from her, and she sneered. I don't know what's wrong with you, Dennis, but I don't like it. First you wouldn't go to Fiji, and now it's Saudi Arabia. Something just isn't right here. She was correct, of course, and I wished that I had the courage to tell why. Life on the surface went on as usual. I turned 60 in 1980 and experienced the normal trauma of examining my life, weighing successes against failures, pleasures against pain, and expectations against fulfilment. Whatever doubts I had about approaching senility and mortality were eased by the fact that I entered and won the King's Court Tennis Championship against excellent players half my age. I was doing very well at Morrison Knudsen and had recently brought in a $5 million contract for a major construction project in Kauai. John's life had changed more than mine. She had just turned 55 and had the option as a state employee to take early retirement. After analysing the pros and cons of her job, she decided that eight years of supervising a back-breaking caseload were sufficient. She accepted her pension and an outstanding achievement award from the state of Hawaii and began looking for a new career. A week later, in November 1981, John became the executive director of the Hawaii Refugee Resettlement Organization, a large, non-profit, federally funded program concerned with the thousands of Southeast Asians who were arriving in Hawaii. The new job required a lot of travelling for conferences, fundraising and the like. Frequently for the next two years, Jan flew to Chicago or New York and loved it. Part of her enthusiasm was due to the challenge of her job, but part of it was knowing that she was getting away from the tension of our deteriorating home life. We just weren't talking anymore. Both of us were absorbed by our careers and concerned about advancing old age. But the root of the problem was my unexplainable behaviour. My past was becoming a festering sore, and I was too locked in to change things. When she had a vacation coming, she instinctively chose to spend it with one of the kids, white water rafting down the Colorado River with Mark, or a social visit with Lynn, Steve and young Michael. We barely had a relationship to speak of, although to all our friends we looked like a busy, happy couple. I didn't recognise it at the time, but Jean was showing real signs of emotional stress. The new job and the constant travel were taking a toll, as was our lack of communication. Suddenly there was a new crisis. Lynn had cancer. What began as a small mole on her collarbone was soon diagnosed as a rapidly spreading malignancy. Jean dropped everything, of course, and rushed to her daughter's side at Houston's renowned M.D. Anderson Hospital. Within days, Lynn underwent surgery, and there was some doubt if she would survive. Thank God the operation was successful, 
and the spreading cancer was caught in time. Jean was badly shattered by the experience, however, and the trauma of almost losing her daughter stayed with her for years. We were riding an emotional roller coaster. Our moods fluctuated sharply, seldom in the same direction. One day Jean would be depressed and I would be euphoric. The next day would see the reverse. We took trips around the islands to relax and bring our moods into sync, but we seldom found ourselves on the same wavelength. We still played tennis occasionally and socialised, but it was becoming an effort. Jean buried herself in the resettlement programmes of Indochinese refugees, and I continued to chase large construction contracts for Morrison Knudsen. When business was slow, I took on jobs for other companies, largely, I now realise, to keep me occupied and away from home. I put in a short stint as the marketing director for General Construction Company, trying to collect some $3 million in accounts receivable, and then as an estimator for commercial shelving to install computer flooring in a British observatory at the peak of Mount Mauna Kea. Jan flew more and more often to New York to meet with agency colleagues to promote alien-related laws and programmes. I wish that I had been able to tell her that the alien who most needed her help was me. We were both miserable but didn't know how to get out of it. We were approaching the edge of the final slide. There was a change taking place in Hawaii as well. For generations, the islands had been a heaven for immigrants. Japanese, Chinese, Polynesian, Portuguese, Spanish and Filipinos. More recently, as Jean knew from personal experience, they were arriving in droves from Laos, Vietnam, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Most, however, were legal aliens. The Reagan administration lumped our problem with the epidemic of illegal Mexican immigrants crossing into California, Texas and New Mexico, and decided to crack down in Hawaii as well. Washington dispatched a new headhunter to replace the former district director of the Immigration and Naturalization Service in Hawaii, named Sam Feldman, and all hell broke loose. He absurdly declared that there were 30,000 to 40,000 illegal aliens on the islands and set out to find them. A small army of INS agents was ordered into the field to root them out. What followed was a wholesale violation of civil rights across Hawaii. The papers were filled with stories of Feldman's crusade and the questionable procedures involved. Most people, including John, were outraged at his hardline approach. But I was genuinely frightened. It was only a matter of time until I was swept up in the process. I lived in fear for the next two years, until early 1984, when the growing number of lawsuits against the INS caused a federal court to bring Feldman's campaign to a halt. It was hardly an atmosphere conducive to revealing my fugitive status. In 1982, Jean started talking about planning for our social security benefits. I was nearly 62 and it seemed like a good thing to do. Besides, I thought it might provide us with a chance to mend fences. Little did I realise where it would lead. She began by sending off for her birth certificate and discovered that it had been lost in a courthouse fire in Red Bluff, California. I didn't realise when she embarked on the project that our birth certificates were required, or I wouldn't have been as enthusiastic. Fortunately, it turned out to be a lengthy process, which gave me a lot of time to think of excuses when my turn came to produce my birth certificate. John spent months corresponding with the California Bureau of Vital Statistics, trying to obtain a duplicate. First they wanted confirmation of her identity, then they sent the letters back to be notarised. More weeks passed, and they asked for her parents' names and birth dates. It was a circus. I watched with growing apprehension at the amount of red tape it took to get a simple birth certificate. My God, what would happen if I got into a similar mess? I hoped that Jean would get frustrated enough with the bureaucracy to call a halt to the project before it became my turn. Finally, nearly a year later, Jean's duplicate certificate arrived in the mail. She had done her part, and it was now my turn. I stalled. I pretended to forget to write away for my papers. Hardly an evening passed that she didn't ask if I had mailed off a request. I tried to change the subject or pretend that I hadn't heard. At the beginning she just figured that I had other problems on my mind, but soon it became a corrosive issue. Why are you being so lazy? she asked. Don't you care about your retirement benefits? 
Sure, it's a hassle, but it's the only way we can get our social security package together. Maybe I just didn't understand what was required, and she would painstakingly go over the process again. Sometimes I planned it so that I came home too late to discuss the matter. It was the passport situation all over again. After a while, I simply told her that I had written off to the state capital of New York, which I learned was Albany, and that we would hear from them eventually. She was pleased that I had finally done something. I knew that the crisis was far from over, but I was willing to risk it for a month or two of relief. After six weeks of silence from Albany, Jean decided to take matters into her own hands. Now I was getting seriously worried. Jean was persistent, and, as the Marine Commandant had learned, not particularly frightened by authority figures. Now where was the capital of New York? Oh yes, Albany. Off went the letter, and I waited in dread for the obvious answer. It came several weeks later. They never heard of me. John fired off another letter that minced no words about the low level of competence among state bureaucrats. The answer was the same, only less polite. John couldn't understand it. I tried to shrug it off and wondered aloud if my years as an orphan at the Connecticut School for Boys hadn't caused me to be listed in that state instead. Jean wasted no time in writing Hartford. The reply was the same. She was totally bewildered and began to ask questions. Tell me more about where you were born. What were your folks' names again? How old were you when they were killed in the car crash? I was getting panicky. Every answer entrapped me further. What was the name of that Catholic school? The Connecticut School for Boys. Where is it located? John? Who remembers? I was just a kid. It went on for weeks. Finally, Jeanne wrote to Hartford for the correct address. This time she learned that there was no such school. What the hell was going on here? All I could do was clam up. More weeks passed and the lies were hanging thick in the air. We continued to act normally around our friends and pursue our jobs, but our relationship was in tatters. Our situation was complicated by the fact that business conditions had caused me to be laid off and money was getting tight. Several months went by and I just couldn't seem to find work. Jean was growing resentful about being the perpetual breadwinner and finally convinced me to approach our upstairs neighbour, who was a successful real estate developer. After all, she reminded me, I had a good reputation in the trade. It wasn't like taking charity. To her relief, he offered me a supervisory job on one of his construction sites. Maybe now our lives would get back to normal. When I reported for work, I learned that the job was inside a military base and that I would soon be expected to submit to a security clearance check. Of course, I couldn't do that, and after four days, four days, Jean shrieked. I came home to tell her I had quit. I gave her a lame story about getting nauseous around the aviation fuel. Jean snapped. That was it. She was at the end of the line. Jean suggested that we seek help. She knew the name of a highly respected psychiatrist in downtown Honolulu, Dr. Mark Bernstein, who could give us some marriage counselling. I reluctantly agreed to do it on a trial basis. That walk down the hall to his office was more frightening than the retreat toward Tunis in North Africa. Every cell in my body was alert for a slip-up. I couldn't imagine a greater threat than sitting in a darkened, fashionable office alone with Dr. Bernstein, a soft-spoken and skillful therapist whose goal was to ferret out the very secrets that I had spent my life covering up. I was in agony. I blocked and parried his questions. He asked me back for another visit. This time Dr. Bernstein hammered away at my relationship with Jean. I assured him that I loved her and that she was certainly not at fault. During the next visit, his manner changed abruptly. Did you kill your parents? he suggested suddenly. No, no. Nothing like that, I said, although in a manner of speaking I had declared them dead when I escaped from Deming so many years before. I made that my last visit. Jean, however, continued her sessions although it was clear that I was the problem. Our relationship, complicated by her stressful job, Lynn's recent cancer, and the growing resentment of carrying the financial burden, was driving her toward a nervous breakdown. Since I had announced that I wanted no part in further therapy, it was clear that things would only become worse. 
One evening in March 1982, John and I sat down to discuss our bleak future. It was apparent that I was also at the end of my rope. I had been frightened my entire adult life. I had fought intimacy. I had spent my waking moments rehearsing cover stories. This time there was no talking my way out of it. I was about to lose everything. Wife, protector, companion, safe harbour. The most tragic part was that I really loved Jean. I really did. Oh, I could make it by myself if I had to. I could stay in the construction business or even become a professional artist. In fact, I could probably do well at any job that didn't require detailed forms or a security clearance. I might even go back to the tennis business, although I had to be careful not to get my picture into the paper. I was also forced to admit that Jean would probably fare better without me. She was resilient, a hard-working professional and a fun-loving companion. I knew she would come out of this crisis intact, probably better than I would. This was clearly the death knell of our marriage. Jean begged for some concession, but all I could do was sit on the couch in silence. Our last opportunity for some sort of reconciliation had passed. When the futility of our discussion became clear, we sadly agreed that the only solution was divorce. Jean reluctantly went to the bedroom to begin packing her suitcases. She was leaving. All I could seem to do was stand on the balcony of our condominium and stare at the sunset beyond Lahi Lahi Point. It was all over. I was jarred out of my reverie by the sound of the doorbell and turned back to the living room to see Jean, her bags packed, waiting for the taxi. I watched, almost dumbstruck, as she handed her luggage to the driver. God, if I had only handled this differently, why hadn't I told her the truth in the beginning? I started crying. The taxi driver was wrestling her bags toward the elevator. As she was about to leave, she turned in the doorway. I could see the tears from across the room and made one last try. Are you some kind of criminal, Dennis? This was my final chance, and I knew it. Shaking with emotion, I broke and admitted that I was a fugitive. I was a German soldier. I was wanted by the FBI for the last 37 years. I remember covering my face to control my hysterical sobbing as the dike finally burst and the whole story came tumbling out. We spent the rest of the long night sitting in the kitchen, alternately crying and laughing, as I told the first person in my life who I really was. The next day we went together to the public library in Wayanai, where I showed her on the map where I was born. I traced the fighting across North Africa and pointed out my prison camps in America. She just kept shaking her head in wonderment and squeezing my arm. She kept repeating, It's OK, it's OK. Over the next few days, Jean and I chattered non-stop as I tried to tell her about my life. All my quirks suddenly made sense to her. She was relieved to see that she wasn't at fault in the deterioration of our marriage. Then we faced the question of my legal position and the alternatives I might pursue. We agreed that I wasn't a hard-end criminal after all, and that my case was probably unique. I was brought to the United States against my will as a military prisoner. Moreover, I had escaped at the urging of my government no differently than American prisoners of war did in Germany. Movies were made about the heroes who tunnelled out of Stalag 17. Since I escaped from Deming after the war was over, there might even be some question if I was still a prisoner of war. I didn't break any laws during my escape or since and paid my taxes every year, even if under a different name. Surely they wouldn't deport me to Germany or Poland after all these years. We came to two conclusions. I would surrender to the authorities after my story, these memoirs were published, and Jean would support me whatever the outcome. How lucky I am to have her. A few days later, Jean suggested that I write to the German Red Cross to see if we had any living relatives, and a month later learned to my astonishment that my sister Lotta, now in her mid-sixties, was alive in Braunschweig, West Germany. Overjoyed, we made contact and sobbed together with a woman nearly 5,000 miles away who had thought I was dead for four decades. I learned that my family had suffered terribly under the Russians. They were separated and forced to do farm labour for Poles who had been imported to Schwednitz, renamed Swidnika, by the Russians. 
Eventually, Papa was able to smuggle the family to West Germany. My brother, Paul, died in the early 1950s, and my parents lived into the early 1960s in Braunschweig. Mother and father never gave up hope that you had survived, Lotta shouted in broken English. Papa even placed advertisements in the major German and American newspapers. To the end of their lives, they kept your picture on the dining room table. They never gave up hope that you were alive and happy and free.